are we on here? Mm -hmm. Oh, hi everyone! Welcome back, and welcome back too. Thank you. <sighs> wow, I um, want to wish everyone an incredible new year. Uh, it's been beginning, you know, months back, but now like a reburst. Uh, a, a commitment to uh, follow through all the commitments that we've had last year and hopefully uh, this year. One of the things that I really like to focus on is seizing the moment and making every moment count and uh, not letting one moment bleed into the next. And the Rebbe was very into, you know, um, really making the most of every moment. And of course, a key component so that helps the person maximize their love and relationship because they're not racing through the day so that's actually a very interesting thought and it can be I think you know I think our audience our listeners our friends will understand that I tend to kind of draw everything down to a practical level I want to know how does his monuments, what kind of his monuments, how does it affect our behavior? How do we affect our behavior? Whether it is monuments or what have you. And you've made a point many times of saying that Torah and mitzvahs themselves, and tefillah especially, and Torah after tefillah, allows a drawing down that with Kriyat Shema two weeks ago. Alamita. Shema, uh, Shema at bedtime and then waking up in the morning and, and having that those those angels if I think you put it back then two weeks ago. But I had a thought to talk about your Olive Base Tanya book, but I think this is even a better subject. So I'll put that off for another time. But and what I would like to suggest to people, and, and maybe you can take this up as a kind of... Well, this is from Tan. Yeah. <laughs> and it practical, is. A practical manual. And that is that I think one way to avoid getting caught up in the maelstrom and the maimarabim of the day, right? Um, we're all, you know, striving for, for things or we, there's actually two forms of missing the moment, right? So one is the individual who's always got a, a goal, a strategic goal. I have to buy a house. I have to make partner in a law firm. I have to become the, the best at whatever it is, or I have to achieve financial independence, whatever the goal is, I have to become a Talmud Chacham, it doesn't matter, you know, it's just, there becomes this, this end all and be all goal, and that's important, right? So what do, what do we know as Hasidim of the Neva, what is the ultimate strategic goal? And bring the Mashiach, right? Melech HaMashiach. But each individual, has to have a strategic goal to, as it were, not chase the goal. <laughs> to me? not chase the goal so much that it ends up affecting. Right, but I'm coming at it slightly differently. I, I think that every individual has to have a strategic goal, and it can be in the in the spiritual world, the ruchnius, and it can be in the gashmadika world with parnasa, with your livelihood. Uh, it could be saying, I want to raise my children to be good yidden, good chassidim, they should marry well and, and be happy. So that can be a goal. Um, I would tend to um, probably shy away from those kinds of goals, but whatever your long-term goal is, five years out, 10 years out, 20 years out, 50 years out. You know, it used to be when I was a youngster, when you were still probably toddler, the goal in America was you were tired by the age of 60, then it became 65, and you had a million dollars. Back then a million dollars yeah. meant something. Mm -hmm. And that was it. That was the goal. 
And if you lived up north, you moved down to Florida and you played tennis or golf, right? I mean, that, that's kind of the, uh, that was the American dream. Now, to get there, you also had to buy a house, you had to have a good, good livelihood. So whatever those goals are, um, and I would suggest, um, I need my little <laughs> call. I would suggest, okay. yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to grab it again. I would suggest, you know, speaking to a mashpia, someone that you respect, to give you help in identifying life goals. Because look, at, at different ages, it's going to be different, right? My life goal at the age of 68 is very different than it was when I was 58, or 48, or 18. But once you have that goal in mind, then you have to think through, how do I get there? What is my plan A to get there? And if you're smart, commonsensical, what is my plan B and maybe even a plan C to get there? Because, you know, uh, what we think uh, is going to get us to some goal may or may not work out the way we want it to work out. The apester has his plan. And so, you want to have, and you want to be able to be flexible. So when you see that the, the steps to get to that strategic goal, what we would call the tactical steps, tactically, how do I get to that long-term goal? And lay things out, and even put them down, as it were, on a calendar. What do I want to achieve in one month, in six months, in a year? And literally, when you come to those moments in time, stop and measure how much of my goal have I achieved. It's like the, the, the classic Gantt chart, right? Where you have some ultimate thing you want to get done. You want to build a building. You want to, whatever it is. And then you have to come up with the steps and you have to know how those steps are reticulated. That is to say, there's other people going to be putting inputs in, right? So if your goal is, I want to have my children married, uh, at the right time and to the right person and so they have to have so that's the goal so then how do you get that when you think about their chinuch right and you think about um, their midos you think about their yiddishkeit and their learning all the various parts of the process but have in mind kind of steps and even if it means to write it out and then to be flexible and be able to manipulate it so now how does that then come back to the point that you were making? People can get lost in the Mayan Robin, the tumult of the day, in one of two ways. They can be so focused on the goal, they don't want to hear from anybody else. That's all they want. I gotta make enough money to buy a house. I gotta I gotta, you know, achieve this in my professional field. I have to become the Talmud Chacham. I have to get all the smichas and the dayanas v'chule v'chule. And they don't pay attention to what's going on around them. And that can be the husband who's, you know, I don't have time for you. I don't, you know, take care of the kids. I, I gotta get back to work. I gotta get on my computer. And I'm certainly guilty of that, right? So you can, you can get lost in that strategic goal or you can get so tied up into the minutia of the tactics to get there that you forget that there's a big picture. Mm -hmm. What is the big picture here, right? So I'm so focused on making certain that my child learns this parak of Tanya, this, 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 you know, Chumash and Rashi, or this Sugi of Gemara. It, it's it's part of my my tactics to get to that strategic goal of raising my children right. They've got to learn this. So what happens when they're struggling, God forbid, or things go awry, or other things happen. We don't know the mind of God. We have to improvise sometimes and, and readjust. But they're so tied up in the tactics to achieve this goal, they forget the goal. I want my children to be happy. I want them to be productive. But gosh darn it, they have to learn this Homish and Rashi, and if I have to beat it into them, then they're going to learn it. 
And I, I think those can be the two modalities that, that people get caught up in that we translate in the Hasidic world as the Mayim Rabbin, of just getting caught up in, in, in these machinations that we've come up with ourselves, right? Either the strategic or the tactical. So you have to, you, you constantly have to keep your eye on the, on the long-term goal, but you have to enjoy and live in the process. Yeah, because sometimes the opposite can happen. They're so enmeshed in just what happens to happen to get done for today that they don't even look at the long-term or right. So it's like a balancing act between living fully now and at the same time keeping your eye on the future you know, goals. And that's what Tefila does actually, because it's like when you're engaged in Tefila, you're shutting down the world and you're engaging in the moment of now and you're training yourself not to look so ahead that you lose the moment of the now. And it slows you down. It, it helps you shut the world out for that time period that you need to be able to have that incredible grounding time with you, yourself, and your maker so that you can have that spill over into the rest of your day. I always tell people, like when you're thinking this word and you're purposely shutting out any other ideas right now, because this is what you're focusing on, just literally your brain is getting in the habit of this is what now I need to put my eye on, not on all the rest of the to-do list. So if you're with your child or you're with your spouse, then your brain is capable of shutting out the world to experience and seize the moment of that divine uh, moment with your loved one. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and, and indeed, if you look at Shmona Esrei, right? I mean, you have those wonderful stickers on the tefillah, um, which comes with the... It's all the ones uh, that are in the tefillah book. Right. That I just condensed. <coughs> Excuse me, I apologize. So, so the entire davening has this impact of this, the balance between the strategic and the present, but also your present, right? But even in Shimon Esri, when you connect to the Abishter, you know, Abishter of our forefathers, <coughs> and you praise the Abishter, and then we begin to ask for the specific, the present moment needs that we have, and then it comes back to the, the strategic goal, right? Right, the final gaula, and and so I think. If people can find that balance and utilize Torah that way, right? So, so what do we what do we also know? We know that when we're in the present moment and we're we're davening, and it's a time his bonus to to contemplate your strategic goal and your your immediate needs, right? That's what Shimon Esrei allows you to do. But you're disconnected from everything else, so you have good quality time for meditation in this way. And then what is the first thing, something that you emphasize, and, and Chassidus emphasizes obviously, which is when you're done diving, take a moment and learn David al right? Learn, learn something practical, because that allows the, the meditation of the strategic goal and, and the specific tactical steps to achieve that goal to begin to be actualized immediately. Um, in Kuntur's Eitz Achayim, the Rebbe Rishav actually teaches an apple, as it were, so that uh, a, another key component to be able to be that best person that you want to be in your relationship is to make sure you study Pnimi the Torah after davening as well, or sometimes people do it in preparation of davening, in between davening, there's, you know, 
different than hugging, but that it's very critical because otherwise we don't have the holy ammunition against the temptations of the day and the Yetzirahs. Right. right, so what is the typical Seder? The typical Seder is one gets up, there's a man, goes to the mikvah, comes back, forms a little chasidus to, to open up that panemius, that avas Yisrael, avas Hashem, arouse those kind of channels, and then daven, have a moment that you're speaking about to really meditate <coughs> on the Abishra, our relationship, your strategic goals, your day-to-day -day tactical goals to achieve that, and then to draw it down and to da'as with halacha, da'aramos of halacha. <coughs> and then, of course, you, you, you have chassidus afterward and throughout the day, right? right. So, and, and you also have nigla, you can learn halacha, you can learn rambam, Tanya, Toyota, Toyota, or, but, so there's no limit, and that of course is the beautiful thing about Toyota, is that there just isn't a limit, and you can find within it that which expresses itself through the, the process that we've been talking about in these dialogues. So for example, if Torah is, if Lima Toyota, and if mitzvahs are simply the nigla, are simply the externality of the thing, and I've got to, I've got to do my shiur, I've got to earn this, and I've got to earn that, and I, I just check off the boxes, right? So that's the person enmeshed in the Mayan Rabbim of the tactical day-to-day. -day. I have an obligation. I've got to do the Tanya, I've got to do the I've got to do the Tehillim after Dawei, all chitas, I have to do my da yomi, I have to do my rambam. If, if that's all it becomes, then it's going to have an effect, but it's going to be an externality. It's going to be an, uh, a, a labouche. The question is, a, a, a garment. The question is, does the garment have content within it? Right? Have you filled your heart up? Have you done that with the proper kavana? That's that idea of looking toward the end goal. Yeah, definitely. I was learning recently that um, a soul without prayer is like a soul without a house. I thought that was so exactly the case. As the Rebbe actually points out that but for the words of tefillah, does it prepare your body to be a sacred, holy sanctuary for your soul to reside in? Right, I probably look at it, that's, I think that's true, but I would look at it the other way as well. That is to say, if all you do is daven by saying the words, if all you do is do these checklists, right? I did my chitas, I did this, I did that. Then it's a house without a soul. Right? There's a soul without a house. It, it just, it's floating, right? It's not anchored. It doesn't, it, it, you have, that's, everyone's soul has to be bounded within some, some meaning, some defined, otherwise it's just, as it were, highest, but it's highest without direction. Mm -hmm. But you can also have a house, right? You can build all these kailing, but if you don't have the panemius, if you don't have the, the soul, if you don't understand sure. what it is I'm doing and why am I doing the this, attention, yeah. right? So, why is it that the Semach Tzedek actually says, especially we just had a new year, although this new year blessing comes really on Rosh Hashanah, where there's a decree, kind of a finalized, uh, you know, some say it's actually after Sukkot, some people say it's really solidified on Hanukkah, the end of Hanukkah, but in essence there's this spiritual blessing 
uh, stored in the chambers above, and that's going to be allotted to you for last year's effort. Here's your payback this year. So many would ask, and why do we have to pray every day? You know, because it's already like, you know, it's a decree. This is what's going to be my year. Why should I make any extra effort? Why should I just... So the Samad Tzedek actually says that the uh, spiritual blessing has to go through chamber, through chamber, to another chamber to actually manifest itself in a physical manifestation of that spiritual blessing. And what's the way to do that? Is through prayer. So, um, but, so you can't rely on miracles, and you can't rely that, oh, I have, you know, it's all sealed and packaged and it'll be delivered. No, every day's davening will enable that spiritual blessing to manifest itself in your physical reality. And on the other hand, the Tanakh describes this challenge, especially for men who are making the living and who have on their to-do list and are very spinning from the load of the day. And they believe that, oh, if I work two more hours today and I'm going to put seven more hours of surfing the internet to find a deal and find a client more, because that not only doesn't bring down the blessing, it, but it actually can stuff up the channel to block even the spiritual blessings that would have come your way had you seized the day in the right way. And, and limited yourself because it's not you and your effort of what's going to make your pranasa and make the ends meet at the end of the month. Yes, you can't rely on miracles. You need to, and as the Rebbe, and I read it with my own eyes, and we're still discussing if it's because uh, it was translated in English, but the Rebbe actually says that, you, you know, that Hashem will bless you in all that you do. And what is the doing? Praying. And if you pray, then you can live a normal life without running around like a chicken without your head uh, and, and overdoing the, the, the uh, work and actually stuffing the system uh, of the blessings that are due to you. So he gives an example, the um, like, uh, like a person that goes to a tailor and he loves velvet and satin and lace, us women, right? And they say, make me a beautiful, you know, I'm making a woman's version of it, but make me a beautiful gown with all these gorgeous material, and I want you to use all this, the, the, the whole thing here. And he goes, what? You're only, you're, you're size small. You don't need a, you know, this would make 10 suits. No, 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 make it with all the material. And then what? The person can't use the garment and actually will trip. So that expending extra time, I'm thinking your extra hours of an effort is going to make the difference in your life of your, you know, sustenance is actually blocking the flow of what is destined for you. And when one understands this, and one understands it in a way that it it, it really um, can help the person slow down and smell the roses of the day, and to spend the time with the children, and to spend the time with the, the, the uh, needs of the family, your spouse, your community, and, and then you have a very balanced life where not one minute leads into the next chasing after the, you know, the dream of having that peaceful life. Right, but there's, you know, the the difficulty, and we've talked about this over the years, in, in many of our walks on a personal level, and that is, it can be a challenge, to say the least, to find out where that balance is, right? So you can't rely on miracles, so you have to go out there and build a cave. And um, sometimes, when you look at the lives of the shulchan, Right? The Rebbe gave them many, many things to do and continues to give them many things to do. And um, it, can, it can be overwhelming, right? But even that letter you just recently shared me with the Rebbe that gave that woman, if she doesn't have the strength to do 
you know, the Shlucha says her family comes first, and that's the whole message of Hanukkah. If you don't have enough oil to light the Hanukkah, which is a message for the outside world and your illuminating the outside world, that the Shabbos lighting candles takes precedence halakhically, right. which is the symbolism of your family does come first. Right, but what I'm saying is, the, the, the question becomes, in other words, you're expending X number of hours doing good deeds outside the house, whether it's uh, simply making a living or helping other Jews, counseling other Jews, teaching other Jews, building a base Chabad, whatever it is, right? Making a parnasa to give tzedakah to help build the yeshiva. Whatever that is, even in today's world, a soldier fighting Oyvenu, our enemies, right? So you're doing that, it, a, a flag doesn't pop up and say, okay, stop now, you've done enough, now it's time to go back and, and be with the children or the wife or, or smell the roses, whatever it may be. There, there isn't some magic moment. So well, when how, does, how does one find that balance? It's not so easy, but when you're grounded in your davening, your godly soul is now more in control over the animal soul's desire for the ego to succeed, for the ego to make it, for the even for the anxiety to succeed because the, the, the bills need to make. All that gets settled. All that gets a, a, a harnessed in a more balanced way because you're, now your godly soul is at least 50-50 at war with this animal soul versus the animal soul totally taking over anxiety and panic and, and, and or the ego of I need to you know make it to make me feel good about myself that I succeeded that I was able to provide and all those other things that are coming from the ego when the ego isn't as big you know, we always say when two people get married and two egos are marrying each other, that's where the problem starts. But if at least one of them actualizes a little more their godly essence and through praying that brings out that essence to more of, uh, you know, uh, to the to, to revelation, as it were, then 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 that's all the difference in the world. Then it's it's organic. It's but it's like naturally is easier to find that more holy balance of this endeavor. Right, so the, th the theme here is recurring over on these marriage dialogues because I come at something kind of black and white, you know, concrete. Where's the, what's the formula to find exactly the right answer, find the exactly the right balance? And your response and I think it's the proper one, is the one that says, like with Kriya Shema and creating the angels and the flow down when you wake up in the morning and say Modani and start your day. The same here. What you're saying is that if you trust the process, the Yiddish Hasidish process, and um, just do that, You'll, you'll see that the end result will work. There'll be a balance there. Right. So I, I'm going to liken this, I don't often do it, but I'm going to liken this to um, my avocation, which is, is you know, uh, having my goal to, to, to do triathlons, right? And one of the things that we, we learn early on is you have a, a coach, and that coach gives you different workouts mm -hmm. and some days it's really hard and some days it's very easy and so when it's very easy and you're feeling good you say no, I want to do a hard exercise I want to I want to work out harder and the answer from the coach always is no trust the process and at the end of the day and and you're going to find as you're working out and you're doing your training some days you're super strong and you're just wow where did all that and other days you can't barely lift your leg up. And again, the answer is trust the process. Because at the end of the day, we'll have to, right? To make a distinction. And But what do we know? We know the physical, gosh, world 
reflects the spiritual. So the same process is what you're suggesting. That is to say, we have a coach. The ultimate coach is the Agister. The Ebba is the real life mm -hmm. coach who's given us by God. All the Rebbe, mm -hmm. right? All the Chassidus. Mm -hmm. And the Talia being kind of the, the Torah of, of the coaching that takes place. And it's telling us that you just have to trust the process. Am I going to be explained to you, or are you going to be able to explain to me when is that red flag going to pop up? No, because it's not going to pop up. But we have a we have a seder, we have intentionality in what we do, right? I mean, what is the difference between the nigger world and the Hasidic world? At least in theory. And I would argue in practice and in good part. But at least in theory. And the, the real distinction is the intentionality of Torah and Mitzvahs. Right? It's, it's the Pneumius. How are we connecting to the Abister? What is it when you put on tefillin, when you open a sitter and daven, what are you doing? You have a whole part of, of your teachings. It's, it's in the marriage book, it's in the tefillah book, about speech, right? You're just talking words of Torah. And um, if you understand what you're doing when you're talking, like right? the Alpha has many prokim on, and especially at the beginning of Tanya, right? Regarding the speech of the Abishta. I should add you to my love language uh, chat. It's called uh, uh, that I Well, I learned it from you. No, so I'm just I, saying every day I'm doing right. uh, So that love. there's there's intentionality in what we do. The language of love. Uh, the language of love. And that intentionality provides the, the, the window and even the door to the, the process of, of having the right kavana and of, and, of, and of internalizing Torah as opposed to just doing Torah mitzvahs and there's musr involved you know this teaches us not to do this teaches us to do that and all of this is to, to do God's will I mean and that's right right that's that's nigla that's the revealed Torah and that's Musa that comes from Revealed Torah. And, and that's all wonderful, but without the panemius, without the intentionality, without that internal kavana, what, what am I doing? When I'm sitting here talking words of Torah, am I, am I just being a, a good Jew? Am I opening avenues to literally the, the air that I exhale when I'm when I'm speaking this way, when you're speaking this way, is there is there some truly mystical impact on the world that that has? And the answer is yes. And that's what you come down on. I tend to want to focus on, you know, the, the black and white answer. And you're always teaching me that what you have to do is trust the process. Do it, and you'll see. Say Kriyat Shema Amita. Think about all the good deeds that you did today. And those angels that you created. And when you wake up in the morning, say, I remember from two weeks ago. Yeah. When you wake up in the morning, <laughs> it's it, this, just for that. <laughs> they come back down like Yaakov Sula, like Jacob's yeah. Ladder. And, and they're there for you. And they're there to help you. And they will. Now, can you see those angels physically? No. Many We're, people are feeling them though, like you know, that. I asked why I said oh, see wow. them, yeah. right? They I mean, really see you, them. You, that's trusting the process, right, right? If they didn't feel it, then there wouldn't be a whole lot to the process. That they make an impact, and I think that that um, that is really the lesson, and and it's the core of your teaching in terms of relationships but especially the relationship that a person has to the process, right? 
And that crosses to the Abister, to the Rebbe, to their teachings, all the rabbinic But it's really, it says, I trust, I have a Muna, I trust the process. And um, again, just Lahatil, I mean, that, you hear that all the time in, in athletics, right, when you train. Trust the process. Don't try to be a know-it-all. Don't try to expect that you're, 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 you're going to respond every day in exactly the, 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 the best way. You're not. Trust the process. You're going to have how often to show you. You're going to have the waxing and the waning. But at the ultimately, if you trust the process, the process, as you point out, kind of takes over. That's a very good lesson for me, at least. Well, it's, uh, it's been an ongoing challenge for me over the years, even in the, in the desire to do good in the world, to um, even the holy desire to share what has helped me, to help others. Um, it, but the more I gave myself the time to ground myself in davening, the more I became more balanced and was able to um, put the borders, you know, for my health to sleep, to my health to eat, to my health to exercise, and um, which then ultimately is for the ultimate good of me being able to have many more years to help. So the, the, I'm going to interrupt, and that so that is an important point because someone might respond to this very Hasidic, very mystical understanding of the process. And it is mystical, meaning it's transcendent. It, you, you can't measure these things. Can you measure those angels that we talk about? Can you measure the process? No. And but you can feel the shift. Right. This one woman called me, she was so... You can, I, I would say you can experience the shift. Yeah. Right? Feeling, you can't measure feeling it. Feeling this thing come yeah. and go. But you can experience it, yeah. and so it. This is what you just said about how the davening grounded you, and you were able to then put boundaries so you knew you had to get a certain amount of sleep and eat a certain healthy diet and do a certain. Spend the time to, you know. Right, but it points out that that. And that's a holy endeavor. In and right, I thought yeah. that this can be as it were, mystical. It's not necessarily miraculous, right? There's miracles going on every day. But it's not a miraculous process. It's a, it's a grounded, using your term, right? It's a grounded process. I, I would call it a grounded, mystical process that, that one can experience and see the results, but it's often so much in flux, right? Because we are in flux. You're not always going to be the perfect Hasidic medula or Geber, right? You're 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 going to you're going to have to understand that that it's not a linear line from this point to that point. It's more of a wave, right? And it's 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 got flux to it. But as the, the Rebbe teaches about light, using that notion of the light experiment, right? So the Rebbe talks about the fact that, that how we perceive something, how we understand this mystical process will literally give results of how it's ultimately experienced. And the Rebbe's example, one of many in the, in the quantum physics world is the, the great experiment of light, right? So light can either be understood as a beam of photons or it can be understood as a wavelength, right? So we understand that certain colors are, when you filter out certain parts of the wavelength, it changes the color. So there was this wonderful experiment done back when quantum physics was really emerging based upon the, the mathematics that Einstein had understood. And that is, 
if you if you measured light as if it were a beam with certain filters so that a wave would be canceled out but a beam could get through the filters when you measured it with that in mind it looked like a beam the, the results was a beam of photons yeah. one theory that a lot of but if you but if you change the filter so that a wave could get through, but a beam would not because it had different layers of filters. So a beam would be blocked, but a wave could get through. Well, guess what? The light showed up on the screen on the other side, depending upon how you measured it. I thought P, that it couldn't both be a beam and a wave, but it is exactly what happens. And did ever use that experiment to, to point out the truth of, of, of the fact that ultimately science will catch up with Toyota. Maybe not. Uh, it certainly will make strides toward catching up. But what that teaches us is that you don't have to understand everything about Yiddishkeit and about Hasidishkeit through um, kind of the, the physical, it doesn't make sense. Right. Because in reality, I'll be safe. It doesn't make sense in a Gashmadik way to say, I go to bed, I say, Kriya Shema, and all of a sudden there's angels of my good deeds, and they're going to come back down and give me all this Kriyas for the next day. There's not a scientist in the world who's got a pure science hat on, not as religious hat, who's going to say, yeah, that happens. But the reality is when you do it and you have in mind that's what I'm doing, the next day you experience those angels. Right? You can't deny that. Yeah. It, it is, by the way, the same thing as, as love. Right? How do you measure that? You can... You can have all kind of electrodes on the brain, you can look at wavelengths and you can see the consequence in the physical world. But love itself is not a thing to measure. You can't hold it. You can't measure it. Did you know they did an a interesting study <laughs> between Hasidim because they were very concerned that chickens would be eating corn and it would either turn to hamets or not. So one group said, no, no, it wouldn't go, it's not gonna get stuck in their throat, they're not gonna have, but the other one, no, 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 there's a certain amount of days, you cannot give them corn, because it'll get stuck in their throat, and, and it, they're gonna be, there's gonna be hamets. So they actually did an experiment, and both groups decided to, to check out these chickens and check them in time to see right. if they would have the stuck corn and be chamed stick or not have the stuck corn. So the group that believed that it, they had enough time to digest the corn and it wouldn't be lingering stuck in there, wherever it gets stuck in, and, and the group that thought it would get stuck, it did get stuck, and it was chamed stick. Right. So, it's, so like, it's quantum <laughs> physics with chickens. <laughs> with chickens. Okay, very nice. Anyway, well. Good. I know we have this business meeting tonight. Right, and I've hit my 615 hard stop okay. as well. So hopefully we'll be not with running around like a chicken without our head. We will not be full of chametz and ego, and I gotta, you know, drag myself to the ground to make it, um, and just really ground yourself daily so that you can ground yourself within every moment and seize the moment so that you can actually experience your life in a beautiful way with the people that you love. Amen. Blessings, everyone. See you next week. Okay. Wow. Thank you for joining.